Greetings to all. I'm Tricia Fay from Florida Gulf Coast University, and I would very much like to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to contribute to this discussion on the potter's wheel, a remarkable tool that has dominated most of my working life. The efficient manufacture of a symmetrical vessel is dependent on rotational motion, on the continuous application of pressure by the hands to transform solid clay into hollow form. In heritage settings, the ceramic production sequence is consciously retained across generations through family and community-based training, especially the shaping techniques that include the specifics of rotation. While hand building and wheel throwing practices may appear to be separate or exclusive, in the case of heritage ceramics, these technologies are clearly interconnected by the necessity of rotation. Based on first-hand observation, this presentation will address several different systems of vessel rotation used among heritage potters in the contemporary Anglophone Caribbean. As the result of settlement, colonization, forced movements, and voluntary migrations of peoples, the Caribbean likely has the most diverse demographics of any area of its size on the planet. In six of the English-speaking islands of this region, St. Lucia, Nevis, Antigua, Jamaica, Barbados, and Trinidad, Functional ceramics continue in production by potters working with inherited traditions from Africa, Europe, and Asia. A close examination of the technologies used to make these pots demonstrates a surprising breadth of rotational potting methods, as well as the impact of the potter's wheel on both tradition and innovation. In March of 1993, I was a full-time production potter in Massachusetts, making wheel thrown earthenware pots for the American gallery market. I had a master's degree in ceramics, and I thought I knew a great deal about clay. A five-day family vacation to the Caribbean island of St. Lucia literally opened a door to a whole new world of ceramic history and knowledge, and to relationships with local potters and their families that continue to the present. Documentation on locally produced Caribbean ceramics is surprisingly sparse, and I am deeply grateful to the University Press of Florida for the opportunity to tell their stories in my recent book, Creole Clay. In pursuing this research, my perspective as a maker has been most evident in the analysis of ceramic technology and in an ongoing effort to connect ways of making with cultural provenance. In St. Lucia, the production of functional earthenware vessels by women of African descent in the southern region of Choiselle emerged on the plantation and expanded rapidly in the post-emancipation period to serve newly established rural towns and communities. The signature St. Lucian coal pot set, a charcoal brazier and round bottom cooking pot, belongs to a very long tradition of portable clay stoves used for warming and cooking food in the Mediterranean region which spread outwards in various forms across Europe and into West Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. In Southern St. Lucia, there is a long history of demographic interaction between Eastern Caribbean Amerindian peoples and the descendants of African slaves. But when it comes to the ceramic production methods used by the women potters of Chazelle, the legacy of West and Central Africa is clear. In the summer of 2000, I spent a month in Ivory Coast, watching Baole and Sunufo potters pound wet clay, rapidly coil vessel walls, and finish pots in open field firings in ways undeniably related to St. Lucian production. As observed in this setting, a round bottom fired clay shard supports the base of the expanding vessel and allows the potter to continuously turn the pot throughout the coiling process as she blends the clay from the right hand into the left. Using an identical hand motion while coiling, the potters in Chazelle invariably work while sitting in a chair with a vessel placed on their knees, using a combination of boards and fired clay shards to turn the pot in their lap. This would seem to be a slow process, but in fact, a practice St. Lucian potter can shape a full-size cold pot in 16 to 20 minutes, with a similar amount of time spent completing the vessel when the clay has stiffened up. Among the more than 50 different ceramic production techniques recorded in Sub-Saharan Africa, Olivier Gosselin's detailed description of the methods used by Bafia women potters in central Cameroon includes pounding clay, sitting on a chair or stool, and working with the pot placed on the knees while progressively coiling from the right hand into the left. It is entirely possible that an enslaved woman potter from what is now Cameroon brought these technologies to St. Lucia, 
and in doing so established a community of potters in Choiseul that persists to the present day. Smaller groups of women potters of African descent continue limited production of heritage ceramics in Jamaica, Antigua, and Nevis. In Spanish town Jamaica, Merlene Roden uses the locally named keke, a rounded clay shard, to rotate the clay vessel during all stages of production. However, women potters in Nevis and Antigua have traditionally spun their pots on the wet surface of a table or board. With the use of this method, the potters must prepare their clay to a considerably stiffer state, or the base of the vessel will disintegrate from contact with so much water. Janet McGaffey observes similar wet rotation methods used by Bakongo women potters in Western Zaire, now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Examples such as these strongly indicate that Afro-Caribbean ceramic production springs from a wide range of cultural traditions in Sub-Saharan Africa. Among the 25 to 30 traditional potters in St. Lucia, Irina Alphonse is unique in her exposure to contemporary studio pottery methods and in her enthusiasm for experimentation and innovation. Growing up in a pottery household, she and her sister Jane Fauché are undeniably masters of the African-derived methods used by women potters in Choiseul. From the age of 15, Irina has also consistently taken advantage of ceramics training courses, both at home and abroad. And during our long friendship, we have worked closely together to explore new approaches to traditional production, including building small wood-fired kilns and testing local clays. While she has learned to throw on the wheel, Irina prefers hand building, especially with the rotational help of a heavy-duty Shimpo banding wheel that allows her to make ever larger pots for new markets and take the physical strain off of her knees, avoiding the arthritis that plagues so many potters in St. Lucia. Jamaica is geographically the largest of the English-speaking island countries of the Caribbean. Under British rule, three-quarters of a million African slaves were forcibly brought to Jamaica, and through the work of their hands, several different ceramic traditions were established that illustrate the diversity of African clay methods transplanted to the Caribbean. Pottery production in colonial Jamaica was focused not in the countryside, but in the major urban areas of Spanish town in Kingston, where women potters used methods similar to those in St. Lucia, Nevis, and Antigua. But unique to Jamaica is a making tradition known as the walk-around style, employed by male potters in the Trenchtown area of Kingston, and not seen anywhere else that I know of in the Caribbean region. Here the rotation is not of the pot, but of the potter, whose feet carry his body first counterclockwise to add and blend coils of clay, then clockwise to smooth the vessel walls. Apparently, similar rotational methods have been well documented in use by Gwari potters in Nigeria, and it would seem safe to assume that the walk-around style offers further evidence of diverse African ceramic traditions practiced in Jamaica. However, a far different source of origin for this rotational method is suggested by the provenance of the so-called Spanish jar, dozens of which can still be found in Kingston collections. Recent research has shown that these large ceramic vessels are not Spanish at all, but were made in central Italy for the transport of olive oil to Jamaica by the British Navy during the colonial period. In addition, locally produced versions of this large jar were made for water storage in Kingston at least as early as 1838, as documented by Jewish Jamaican artist Isaac Mendez Belisario. In summer 2018, I traveled to Impruneta, Italy, the historic center for traditional ceramic production in Tuscany, to watch potters spin themselves around their pots and to wonder whether this way of making was brought into Jamaica along with the olive oil. Whatever the origins of this unique method of rotational potting, it was one of its practitioners, Cecil Baugh, who actively sought out training in wheel throwing methods and in doing so completely transformed Jamaican ceramics. Following his service in the British Army in World War II, Cecil Baugh's desire to better understand the technologies of making, glazing, and firing pots took him to England for 18 months, where he worked closely with several of the most famous potters in the country. As he improved his throwing skills, Baugh was often asked to demonstrate the Jamaican walk-around style, notably on BBC television in 1949. In the decades following his return to Jamaica, 
Cecil Baugh would launch a national practice of wheel throwing and high temperature glaze firing, found the ceramics department at what is today the Edna Manley School for the Visual Arts, and establish a major museum collection for locally produced ceramics at the National Gallery of Jamaica. Unlike the diverse lines of inheritance in Jamaica, the history of local ceramic production in Barbados demonstrates a direct and consistent lineage to the English country pottery tradition through nearly 400 years of continuous use of the potter's wheel. In the mid-17th century, two English potters arrived in Barbados as indentured servants with the skills to produce industrial ceramics and train slave potters on the recently established and wildly lucrative sugarcane plantations. Shards from wheel-thrown sugar molds and molasses drainage jars can still be found in the ruins of plantation kilns buried in the bush near the aptly named area of Pothouse. Following emancipation in 1838, former slave potters set up in the village of Chalky Mount, close to abundant sources of highly plastic clays well suited to wheel-thrown ceramics. By 1886, Chalky Mount was described as the site of one of the few industries in Barbados with male potters producing extraordinary numbers of functional earthenware pots for marketing by women vendors in the capital city of Bridgetown. Vintage postcards from the early 20th century offer ample evidence of the abundance of Chalky Mount pottery in Barbados, with a later postcard, circa 1960, providing the only documented illustration of the signature two-person wheel-throwing process. When compared to prints and photographs of the wheels used in the English country pottery tradition, there is no question as to technical origin, despite considerable historical and geographic distance. This two-person system was a very efficient way of distributing the physical stress of making pots, and allowed the skilled thrower to work uninterrupted while a less skilled family member or day worker turned the wheel head. There were also social and educational aspects to this arrangement, and I have heard several stories from potters in Barbados today of time spent in their youth pushing the wheel for the chalky mount throwers in the previous generation. At 166 square miles and with approximately 290,000 people, the island of Barbados is among the most densely populated countries in the world. As a result of unique geological and historical events, there is also a greater density of potters and likely more functional pots made per square mile than in any other country in the Caribbean. The combination of fine-grained sedimentary clays with consistent access to the potter's wheel was essential to this evolution. Over the past 50 years, the ceramic industry in Barbados has been consciously reinvented through a series of training programs, the establishment of individual and cooperative pottery business ventures, and aggressive marketing to a thriving tourism sector. Hamilton's Pottery in St. Thomas, Barbados is an excellent example of local production and technological support. Potter Hamilton Wiltshire digs his clay near Chalky Mount, fires in a propane kiln designed and built on the island, and has developed a production line that ranges from heritage forms like the iconic water cooling monkey jar to custom commissions for dinnerware finished with his original glazes. Beyond the definitive documentation of the 17th century arrival of white indentured potters from England, the obvious similarities in the two-person wheel design, and the post-emancipation establishment of the pottery village of Chalky Mount, there is more subtle evidence of strong connections to the wheel-throwing traditions of the English country potter. Hamilton Wiltshire remembers well the first day with his teacher, Chalky Mount potter Clement Devonish, whose huge hands could make the clay dance on the wheel head. As seen with coil building methods, the sequence of hand motions used to throw pots on the wheel are specific to the potter's training. And in the case of Barbados, I believe they reveal further continuity with English country pottery. As this tradition was slowly abandoned in the decades after World War II, the ways of making were carefully documented in text and film by British and American potters. The elegant, efficient motions of Hamilton Wiltshire's hands, as trained by Chalky Mount potter Clement Devonish, mirror that same efficiency seen in the hands of Isaac Button, considered the last of the English country potters. In the southern Caribbean country of Trinidad and Tobago, potters descended from South Asian indentured laborers today make wheel-thrown vessels for Hindu ritual practice as well as for the home and garden. Over the past 120 years, 
they have evolved the technology of the wheel from the stone discs of India to remarkably efficient machines made from car parts and electric motors. The oral histories of the pottery families in Trinidad begin in 1898 with the arrival of two brothers, both potters, who would establish a ceramic industry in the clay-rich central plains of Chaguanas. Today in this area, there are multiple family workshops producing enormous numbers of largely unglazed earthenware pots. One branch of the family moved south and established a second production center outside the town of Rio Claro. The use of the potter's wheel is essential to these operations, and in the rapidly expanding economy of Trinidad, most potters report that they have as much business as they can handle. Sugar cultivation and African slavery came late to Trinidad, with the arrival of French Creole planters in the Spanish-held colony in the late 1700s, and was aggressively pursued under British rule after England's formal acquisition of the island in 1802. Following the emancipation of the slaves in 1838, sugarcane planters looked to another British colony for cheap labor, and the 72 years of the Indian indentureship scheme would fundamentally transform the population of Trinidad. The majority of those who came were Hindu, and they brought with them a rich tradition of personal spiritual practice and major public events dominated by the annual celebration of Diwali, the Festival of Lights named after the small wheel-thrown clay oil lamps called diyas. They are lit for one new moon night in late fall, according to a complex ritual calendar, and literally millions of these tiny clay pots are placed in the front yards, balconies, driveways, and sidewalks around Trinidadian homes and businesses, and left to burn throughout the night. According to Hindu belief, all diyas used for ritual purposes are destroyed after a single use. The rotational technologies used to meet Trinidadian demands for clay pots have gone through a remarkable transformation process. The original heavy stone discs used by potters in India were reproduced in Trinidad, but were progressively replaced in the 20th century with mechanical contraptions made from repurposed machinery. Car parts in particular would provide inspiration for a two-person wheel developed using the axle and differential from an automobile attached to a wheel head made from cement poured into a tire rim. Later one-person versions would include more car parts and run on gasoline, and when electricity became commonly available in the 1970s, potters added small electric motors with a transmission and gear shift to better control the speed of the wheel for larger and more complicated forms. However, to fire the many, many pots made on these extraordinary wheels, Trinidadian potters stayed with the technology of heritage kilns, a two-level updraft design with a large single firebox, perforated domed arch, circular kiln walls, and temporary roofing made of clay, straw, and fired shards. Watching Sukdeo Dionarain throwing dias is an education in the efficiency of the potter's wheel. Working off a large lump of centered clay, he can throw and cut off one of these small dishes every two or three seconds. Standing close by, his daughter Asha removes each one to a long board and flicks her fingers across the rim to shape the tiny spout that will later hold a cotton wick in coconut oil when the dia is lit. Sukdeo can make a thousand dias in 90 minutes, 5,000 dias a day, and two days of production, 10,000 dias, will fill the family's wood-fired kiln. This direct drive wheel has only one very fast speed because there's no time for starting and stopping the wheel when making a quota of 5,000 dias a day. The many examples of rotational strategies described in this presentation highlight the position of the Caribbean as a unique melting pot of global ceramic traditions and underscores the opportunity for using ways of making to trace cultural continuity to countries of origin for peoples who have been displaced across time and space. It is also clear that the inheritance or adoption of the potter's wheel in the region greatly improved the adaptation of production lines to meet changing markets, and in particular to make pots that appeal to external consumers and tourist visitors. But it is also important not to underestimate the local buyer and to acknowledge the role played by potters in maintaining heritage practice and cultural identity in these small island nations. In the end, the wheel is just a tool and rotational potting a strategy for efficient production. As this wheel turns, it is up to the potter to define her cultural space in a rapidly evolving world and to adapt working methods as needed to support her chosen occupation.
Thank you.